we're going to start by looking at uh, Psalm 146. Now, if we were the we freeze, we would sing it. I'm sure Martin as a Scot would play it, but I'm not sure that we would manage it. But, so I then thought, well, let's read it together. But then I realized we don't all have the same version. So that wouldn't be a good idea. So let me read it as a beginning to our time tonight. So let's begin with reading Psalm 146. The psalmist says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord, O my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On the very day their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations, praise the Lord. Two uh, short, not too long readings. First one is in the book of Colossians and chapter 3. And we'll read just the first 17 verses. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is an idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of the creation. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as Christ's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you will call to peace, and be thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Uh, Romans chapter 12 and just two verses which I want to take as our text for tonight and I think you will find if you think about it and read it again carefully that those verses which we have been reading in Colossians are probably the best possible exposition of these verses in Romans. Perhaps we should have read Romans first. Paul says this in chapter 12. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to attest and approve what God's perfect will is his good pleasing and perfect will how would you describe this year so far if you were asked to just give a brief clip of what you thought was the highlight of the year, what would you, what would you say? Would you say, well, it's been a year of war. We have not got over the problems that they have in Ukraine. And the situation in the Middle East seems to go by the day from worse to worse or would you say well I remember it it was the year of the Olympics and we did so well with our medals both in the Olympics and in the Paralympics or do you think you might describe it as the year of elections oh 19 uh, 19 2024 there were 97 countries who held elections. Nearly half the global population, including some of the largest nations in the world. Brazil, India, Russia, USA are about to hold theirs. France, and not least, the United Kingdom. Great swathes of the world went to vote. Now, five weeks before we had our election here in the United Kingdom, uh, the Prime Minister, whose prerogative it was, announced the date. And in those weeks prior to the election, we had what we call the hustings, where the potential candidates went about their uh, their patch went, uh, went about uh, their constituency to explain how their political party was going to transform our country and how it was going to bring about change. Each of the main political parties wrote a manifesto, a publication which I didn't get a copy of and couldn't find one from any of them, but I'm told that they existed, were to contain the policies and what, of what the party stands for. And in particular, the changes which they wished to implement. Now, manifestos as I don't need to remind you, are full of aspirations. They give the big picture, but they're short 
on detail. They explain what they would like to do rather than how they're going to do it. The book of Romans has been described as a manifesto for the salvation of the world. Not just for the UK or Europe, but for the whole world. And Martin Luther once said that Romans is the chief part of the New Testament and that we can never read it or ponder it too much. Calvin, on the other hand, said that the understanding Romans opens a pathway to understanding the Bible. Whereas those of you who are familiar with John Piper, the American evangelical leader, says that Romans is the most important theological Christian work ever written. Years ago, when I was a, a student and lived in Manchester, we had a citywide campaign. Barry will be interested to hear that it was led by Peter Brandon and Ivor Powell, who worked in the very town of Chesham in Pond Park many years ago. But Peter and Ivor came to Manchester for about three weeks, and it was a multi-church uh, 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 gathering uh, every night during the week, and there were many, many who came to know Christ as Saviour and Lord. And so the question arose afterwards, having had such blessing in the city, what we were to do with those who had come to faith. Some of them from families who had no background in Christian things at all, who knew nothing of the gospel until they'd actually been sitting there hearing of God's grace. So how were they to be followed up? What were they to be taught? Well, of course, this invoked discussion. Were we to begin and have a series of meetings starting in Genesis 1? Well, maybe, but perhaps we'd be better looking at the New Testament. What about Matthew? Well, Matthew begins with the great genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, someone will say, well, we'd be much more appropriate if we looked at John, John's Gospel. Well, you know where I'm coming to, don't you? We began with Romans. Because Romans is a clear declaration of the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul dictated his letter uh, by, through his companion, Tertullus, to the Christians at Rome, possibly around about AD 58. We don't need to worry ourselves precisely about dates. In order to set out the fundamentals of the gospel. However, unlike political manifestos, it wasn't just to set out what the gospel was, but it was equally important how it was to change lives. Our present government are claiming that what is needed is change. How true it is. But it is change in the hearts and lives of people that this country needs. Romans, it deals with the great themes of the gospel with sin of humanity, Jews and Gentiles alike, rich and poor, slave and free, and that all can know the righteousness and forgiveness of sin from a holy God. Romans is a book in two halves. In chapters 1 to 11, the Apostle Paul sets out the fundamental doctrines of righteousness, sin, God's mercy, Forgiveness for all, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. We might say that from uh, chapter 12 to 16, he moves from doctrine to duty, from belief to behavior, from theory to practice. But if there is to be a change in the world, it needs to be more than theory or doctrine. 
just as political manifestos whilst giving us the big picture often like the detail how change is to be achieved so with the gospel we need more than doctrine we need to know how and what practical steps to take to implement it in our lives day by day we need to know the how as well as the what so often I feel and I don't speak of our church here at Chartridge but in general we fail to deal with the application of the gospel in the lives of believers what the world needs today is to see how the gospel changes people's lives Jan Ungwanski you'll say whoever is Jan Ungwanski was a former chief of the Cherokee Indians in North America and he once said well the Bible seems to be a good book strange that the white people are not better after having had it so long what then are the guiding principles of change that Paul sets out in this letter which he writes uh, to the believers at Rome and let's just stop for a moment and put this book which this letter which Paul wrote in its context Nero was the emperor he'd been there in as emperor for just a few years and the horrors of life ahead under Nero were yet to come he begins in chapter 12 verse 1 with therefore and you've heard it said many times that we should ask what the word therefore is there for well in this case it is to see how that the gospel which he has explained over the previous 11 chapters can transform lives families whole communities and nations he's now moving from belief to behavior from doctrine to duty so let's unwrap these two short verses uh, with three thoughts first of all the urgency of the apostles appeal the urgency of the apostles appeal then he says something about the basis for his appeal why is he making an appeal to the Christians in Rome and finally he gives us some thought on the relevance of his appeal urgency of appeal the basis of appeal and the relevance of his appeal Paul begins in verse 1 in chapter 12 by saying I urge you the New Living Translation says I plead with you the ESV says I appeal to you and the word used for urge is translated elsewhere as beseech entreat entreat or I beg you there's an urgency there's an earnestness in Paul's plea this is no casual wouldn't it be a good idea if we did this or I suggest or recommend he says I urge you and we can't over emphasize that he was anxious to impress on the believers that the seriousness of the need for a radical change in lifestyle we read those verses in Colossians deliberately because that was exactly the same message that the Apostle was passing on to the church in Colossae giving some examples of the need for change change was to be radical but wasn't that after all how Christ lived a radical life 
No longer will they continue a life of sin and immorality conforming to the life of this world. On the other hand, they were not to hide themselves as monasticism or asceticism. They were in the world. But they were not to adopt the standards. There was to be a distinction and there was an urgency in Paul's message. Now he says, who, is, who am I urging? He says, therefore I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy. Now I thought, what are we going to do about this? If it says brothers, then we can forget the sisters. Aha, not a bit. Because I looked it up. And I found that if you, and I'm not a Greek scholar, so this is not trying to impress you. But I found that the word that is used here literally means those from the same womb. Now, I have a sister. I have a brother as well. We have a joint mother. The point is that the word here is not just for male at all but we need to look at the context and what has gone before in these chapters what paul is urgently asking of the believers in rome is for everyone and he says in verse uh, 17 and 18 of chapter 1 for in the gospel a righteousness from god is revealed a righteousness that is by faith the gospel is appropriated by faith, not by works. Not as he explains by following the law of Moses. In chapter 3, verse 9, he says, Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles? So when he speaks of brothers, he's referring to all who have stepped out in faith not those clinging to the good works and the traditions of the rabbis. Now, all believers, whatever their religious or ethnic background, are now in Christ, one in Christ Jesus. What was the basis of his appeal? Well, we have the answer to that too. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. That was the basis of his appeal. God's mercy. I don't know how many of you will remember, uh, in 1965, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, country of Zimbabwe was then known as Southern Rhodesia. And... Uh, <coughs> Uh, in 1965, the then Prime Minister of uh, uh, Southern Rhodesia was a man called Ian Smith. And uh, he and his government declared what became known as UDI. It was a unilateral declaration of independence. Southern Rhodesia had been a British territory since 1923. But the then government uh, decided that they were an independent sovereign state and that it didn't matter what the British government thought or decided the decision was made that they were going to unilaterally be independent of Britain. Now, that caused a big political furor at the time, and eventually, of course, they did become independent, and we now have the nation of Zimbabwe. I mention that because here we are told by the apostle in view of God's mercy. And God's mercy to us is unilateral. It doesn't depend on who we are, Jew or Gentile, as the Apostle has said, male or female, slave or free, not anything we may think or do can earn us God's mercy. 
for 11 chapters. Paul has been unfolding God's sovereignty and his unilateral mercy. And he says in chapter 9, verses 14 to 16, What shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all, Paul says. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It does not depend on man's efforts, but on a sovereign God and his abounding mercy. Rhodesia unilaterally declared itself a sovereign state. And Paul makes uh, this appeal as he reminds them that there is no greater incentive to holy living and demonstrating our salvation than the mercy of a righteous God. So Paul's appeal was not just an urgent appeal. It, it was not just uh, the basis of appeal was mercy. But there was a relevance to it. How in practice are we to demonstrate our salvation and show God's salvation is for all now and for eternity. His appeal is twofold. It concerns our whole person, both our bodies and our minds. Ha ha, you say. I knew we would finally have to do something to gain God's salvation. Not a bit of it. Not a bit of it. Not so. Paul has been at great pains to show that salvation is by faith, not by works or anything that we do. And he says when writing to the Christians at the church at Ephesus, he says, for it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can be boast. His appeal is to our bodies so that we can demonstrate a changed life. What then are we to make of verse 1? Where it says we are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Well, this immediately reminds us of the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Now, now is not the time uh, to talk in detail about the many and varied sacrifices that we have uh, in the Old Testament, but there were two types of sacrifices that the nation of Israel were reminded of. There were those that were obligatory for the offering of sin, and there were those that were voluntary which were an expression of their worship. Let me remind you again of that. There were those that were obligatory because of sin, and there were those that were voluntary because of worship. So it is with us. Our obligatory sacrifice has been made. Paul, writing to Corinthians, he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It is what God had promised throughout the Old Testament, a promise kept when Christ gave his life as a sin offering. It was an obligatory offering made by Christ. God has done his part, and now the apostle says that we are to do ours. If there was to be an obligatory sacrifice, there was the opportunity uh, to have a voluntary sacrifice. And our act of worship is when we offer our bodies, our whole beings to God. Whereas in the Old Testament times, the sacrifices with animals were brought to the altar and offered up by the priest. We, in contrast, 
are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. But then, what does it mean to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice? Well, the revised English version is perhaps a little bit helpful. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy and pleasing to God. Not dissimilar to what it is in the NIV. Weymouth, who has a, a less literal translation, says to present your faculties to him as a living and holy sacrifice. In other words, God requires our all. Uh, my father-in-law uh, had the joy of leading one of his colleagues uh, to Christ. Eventually, that colleague became uh, a full-time Christian minister of the gospel and was the minister of Moody Bible Church in Chicago. Although he was an Englishman from Northumberland, come, uh, he, he eventually ended up as leader of the church in Chicago. Alan Redpath was his name. And Alan Redpath tells the story uh, he was uh, away uh, traveling and ministering the gospel, and he arrived home one end of a week uh, and he had two little girls. And as he arrived home and he dropped his cases, he went into his study, and I'm sure his wife brought him a cup of tea, and he sat down, and at that point, the girls rushed towards him. Now, think of the doubting Thomas. What was doubting Thomas's response? When he saw the Lord, he said, My Lord... And my God. Alan Redpath was sitting there. His young girls rushed in and jumped on his knee. And one of them said, Daddy, you're mine. And the other said, Daddy, I'm yours. That's the meaning of presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. We say, Daddy, I'm yours. God requires our all. The tragedy of our age is that in the West, we no longer are 100% for the Lord. But why not? Well, I think for the answer to the question lies before us in the scriptures. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of the Lord's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing, that's your act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind, that you will be able to test and approve what is God's perfect will the answer to the question why we're not a hundred percent for Christ surely Paul says that the Roman Christians were to do three things they were not only to present their whole bodies or their whole selves their whole personalities to God but they were not to conform to the pattern bracket standards of this world but they were to be transformed by the renewing of their minds one negative and two positives they were not to follow the world but they were to give themselves wholeheartedly to God wonderful you say but again how can we renew our minds how can our minds be transformed Paul writes to the church at Philippi, doesn't he? He says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. 
And here Paul gives an answer which is loud and clear. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world. William Barclay, the Scottish theologian, said of this verse, Don't be a chameleon which takes on the colour of its surroundings. Or J.B. Phillips, I like Phillips' paraphrase, don't let the world squeeze you into its mould, but let God remould your minds from within. So it's clear we are not to conform to the patterns of this world, to current culture. We are to be distinctive. We are not to take our standards from Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or even the BBC, our daily paper. We are to take our standards from the Word of God. And we must, of course, live in this world, in society at large, but not by its standards. Paul, when writing his letter to the church at Corinth, the second of his letters, he says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. If ever there was a time in history when God has blinded the minds of humanity, surely it's today. It is inconceivable, isn't it, that a child which is born as a boy, brought up as a boy, is suddenly deemed to be a girl. It is sheer intellectual nonsense. But the God of this world has blinded the minds. This is why Paul urges the believers in Rome to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. We've become used to the word fake news. Well, the greatest fake news in this world is that Satan wants us to believe that he does not exist. Not just a little red goblin with a fork. Brothers and sisters, the devil is real and the battle for our minds and the minds of our families and especially our grandchildren and our children is as real today as it has ever been. John Stott says in his commentary on these verses, he says, here we have two value systems, this world and God's will. They are incompatible with one another. They diverge so completely that compromise is not possible. So what? are we to do about it? So Paul says we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How are we to do it? What do we watch? What do we read? Where do we go? With whom do we spend our time? The word for transform is the, is, 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 is the word metamorphosis and what's metamorphosis it's the process isn't it whereby an insect such as a butterfly is immature as a larva and forms and becomes an adult god wants us to abandon the immaturity of this present world and to be mature in the likeness of christ this, he reminds us in chapter 8, is the very purpose of the gospel that we might be conformed to the likeness of Christ. When Moses died, God chose Joshua, one of two faithful spies, 
to take over the leadership of the Israelites. And at the end of his life, Joshua offered a challenge to Israel. Israel could follow the ways of the surrounding nations where they were living, or they could follow the ways of Jehovah. And in his final appeal in, 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 uh, in, in, in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15, Joshua says this, But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. As Paul has moved on in this great epistle, this great letter to the believers of Rome, from doctrine to duty, from belief to behaviour, he makes a serious, urgent appeal, an appeal that is based on God's abounding mercy. They were to offer them very selves, their minds, their all to God, as their spiritual worship. Paul was urgent in his appeal. He showed how it was based on the mercy of God and how its nature is to be shown in the way we live. It was just about 2,000 years before Paul made his appeal to the Romans. Joshua made a similar appeal to the people of Israel. They were to be challenged where their hearts lay. And Paul's appeal is as relevant to us today as it was in Joshua's time. The choice is yours. <laughs>